and I apologize for having to be the last uh, speaker. And it reminds me, I, I grew up in the uh, kind of cruel world of uh, general surgery. We used to be on every other night of calls, so it was usually Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And they usually put us in the hottest room to go over selected readings uh, in the late afternoon. And so one time I had to do this, and I look up, and literally everybody in the, in the entire room fell asleep. So what I did is I just looked over them, and I go, that's it. I, did, I didn't, read, didn't read a word. It took me five minutes, and then everybody went home. Um, <laughs> so I wish I could do that for you today, but I, unfortunately, I'll try to zip through this as much as possible. Uh, one other thing I'll mention about uh, John Ide's uh, comments, uh, I, uh, although I love John, you know, it's, I think most of my our, our patients who have plantar bypass are happy they have a shoe to put on as opposed to any uh, prosthesis, so I wouldn't diss the uh, plantar bypass too much, although their patency is a lot less than the other ones. So looking at uh, uh, lower extremity aneurysms, which is not the most scintillating talk, uh, popliteal is the one that's probably the most devastating and the one we deal with the most. We're going to go through a few things. Now, unlike uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms to thoracic aneurysms, uh, most of you know popliteal aneurysm thrombose, and the limb loss from that can be up to 50 percent. So we're going to go through a few uh, things quickly. Um, now, one of the other things about popliteal aneurysm is it's like a little bit of a misnomer because sometimes they don't always occur in the exact same spot. They aren't in the popliteal fossa all the time. Sometimes they extend up into the SFA. Sometimes they extend down to just above the tibial vessels. And so one really has to look at the anatomy to figure out what is the best therapy for these, uh, uh, for these patients because there are different approaches uh, on how to repair them. Uh, the normal diameter of the uh, popliteal artery is less than a centimeter, so anything over two centimeters should be uh, concerned about. Uh, aneurysms that have a lot of thrombus in are probably more likely to spit or to embolize distally uh, or to thrombose, so those are the ones we're concerned of. However, the ones who are not filled with thrombus tend to enlarge more quickly. Uh, so if, once you identify them, you really need to follow them if they're small, uh, and patients need to know the potential complications, because what's horrible is sometimes you'll sit at home for two days with an ischemic leg, and then by the time you get to them, it's non-salvageable. Um, it is the most uh, um, common peripheral artery uh, aneurysm that we see, uh, and also a, a semi-complicated chart is most of the uh, aneurysms you'll see are, are uh, inferenal abdominal aortic aneurysms and thoracic and popliteal and femoral after that. Um, most of them are atherosclerotic, and uh, you know the etiology is always uh, presumed that uh, the vasovasori get clogged with uh, the atherosclerotic disease, in which weakens the wall and then they become bigger. Uh, there are some other uh, things you'll see, such as cystic uh, adventitial disease, which is more of an extrinsic com compression of a lumen uh, that you just remove, uh, or you can do an inter interposition bypass for that. Uh, we won't go into the popliteal entrapment of the dysplasias. Uh, or primary infections, which are extremely rare. The risk factors are, as you see, in most atherosclerotic patient populations, which are uh, males, uh, smokers. Uh, when in our system, we usually say 60% of our patients are smokers, and the other 40% are liars. Um, hypertension, uh, ischemic heart disease, or rather, the rest. Um, again, the usual uh, um, presentation, or, or at least presentation for repair, is about three centimeters. Um, many of these will have repeated uh, embolization or will have atherosclerotic disease, so they will only have one to sometimes one vessel runoff, which actually imp um, impacts a little bit on your uh, choice of uh, reconstruction. Uh, about half of them will have contralateral uh, artery, um, popliteal artery aneurysm, so it, it behooves you when you see a patient with abdominal aortic aneurysm to do a physical exam, or at least book them for a physical exam with somebody, uh, and look at their, feel their, their uh, femoral uh, area. You will not get the exact size, but at least it will, it will tell you whether you should do a, uh, an ultrasound, and also feel behind the knee to, to feel a fullness, and if you do feel a fullness, uh, you then can get a, an, an ultrasound in order to evaluate that. So about 38%, a, about a little higher, will have a concomitant uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. And from this study, you can see all the uh, statistics, which will be mind-boggling, especially at fi almost 5 o'clock on the last, uh, second to last day. Um, but what it comes down to, if they have an aneurysm, abdominal aortic aneurysm, they have a de reasonable chance of having a popliteal, a low chance of having a popliteal aneurysm. If you have a popliteal or femoral aneurysm, you have a fairly high chance of having an abdominal aortic aneurysm. So you really need to be uh, rigorous in your evaluation. Now, one of the things I think is always vexing is when you have a, a large abdominal aneurysm and a popliteal aneurysm, which do you fix? First, um, 
the, the concerns early on were that if you fixed you know, the popliteal artery aneurysm, then you then you did the abdominal aortic aneurysm, you could have a, uh, could knock out the the bypass or the uh, endovascular repair. I think that, that you really should just deal with the largest aneurysm and then work through that. And make sure you anticoagulate them adequately when you're uh, doing the uh, con um, the sec subsequent aneurysm. Uh, most of them, or about half of them, present uh, asymptomatic. Uh, the symptomatic ones. Um, you can present with the worst ones are the ones with acute limb ischemia. Um, those, the, one of the classic questions you'll always get asked if you have bilateral popliteal aneurysms and a patient comes in with one thrombosed and one form centimeter and one uh, with uh, claudication symptoms and the other uh, with a five or four centimeter uh, popliteal aneurysm, which do you fix first? You fix the not asymptomatic popliteal aneurysm first because the risk of uh, thrombosis and limb loss. And about, two, about three quarters of them are fixed uh, electively. Um, Again, you can read uh, these are some of the clinical presentation, uh, which is uh, somewhat boring, but really you need to identify these early. These, these can affect the patient as much as an abdominal aortic aneurysm in the sense that they will lose their limb and they will have uh, a shortened lifespan and will have a significant disability if you don't fix them uh, when they're asymptomatic and when they're first identified. Um, we, we usually use around two and a half to three centimeters. Again, it's not based on a tremendously uh, large population, although there are some patients by one by Dave Dawson, uh, which will show you. Um, they, do get, they do grow over time. And again, as you see here, many of them are uh, distal SFA aneurysms as well as they are popliteal aneurysms, and that will, that will direct your, uh, your therapy. Um, one of the things, uh, again, uh, there's, I would, I would put the therapies in three kinds. There's endovascular open, then there's lytic therapy, which is an adjunct to e, uh, either of those. Uh, use of lytic therapy is, has been touted and is, is useful, but it's also a challenge to figure out which patients are appropriate for lytic therapy. Usually you want to see those patients that have a viable extremity that you can, that can tolerate a waiting a little bit of time, or patients that don't have any runoff and you're really looking for an outflow vessel to, to perform a bypass. I would argue the latter group, I would just as soon explore their, their arteries to see what uh, bypass you have, because when patients have acute occlusion of their uh, arterial tree, they actually will not have runoff that you can visualize that with the angiogram, and we found that out from our experience. Uh, although most of us would love to treat these uh, endovascularly, about 80% of them are still treated with open uh, surgery, uh, most through the medial approach. Uh, again, the posterior approach is a beautiful approach, uh, which uh, is not used commonly, and mainly for two reasons. One is it, it's limited by the adductor canal proximally and uh, the musculature distally. Uh, we tend to use the, the small saphenous vein and reverse it if we go up posterior, but you really need a, a very discrete aneurysm in the posterior fossa in order to uh, fix it. For string grafts, you'd like to have shorter uh, areas of, uh, of, of aneurysmal disease uh, and have good landing zones proximal distally, which is not always possible, and that's one of the reasons why you tend to do more open um, than uh, endovascular, and about 7% of them get thrombolysis. Again, when you read about it, you think that most people should get thrombolysis, but for the, in clinical practice, it's really a very small uh, proportion. Again, looking at uh, the, the two types of repair, uh, open repair restrictions are very few. Um, uh, if you don't see a target vessel, and again, I would argue that the, one of the reasons you, see, you don't see a target vessel um, is because the lack of flow, because it's an acute occlusion with poor collateralization. Um, but at that point, lysis may be an option, depending how viable or non-viable the foot is. Uh, for uh, endovascular repair, obviously, if you have no access to the uh, popliteal artery, uh, i.e., that you have an SFA occlusion, that's, pro that's a problem. Uh, thrombosis or rupture, I think you can still do endovascularly. It depends on how the an anatomy that you're presented with. Um, and a long popliteal uh, aneurysm is always a challenge. As you go across the joint, it, the uh, patency rate of these tends to be less. And that's why, again, you need to have a good, a good discrete popliteal aneurysm with a, about a two centimeter or one and a half to two centimeter landing zone proximally and distally. And, and some people say with single vessel runoff, you'd rather um, you do a bypass than an endovascular repair. I think that's dependent on what you're comfortable with, but also if you do an endovascular repair, you really need to follow these patients up closely because the revision rate of endovascular repairs is significantly higher than it is for bypass. Here's one study uh, by uh, Greg Landry, uh, which showed you essentially this distribution of which patients are eligible for endovascular, which is about a quarter of them. Uh, if they're uh, symptomatic and about, uh, he said in this, which I think is a little high, about two-thirds were el eligible in, uh, for the asymptomatic patients. Um, the, again, the, for the open repair, there's medial and uh, posterior approach 
Uh, I think most of us prefer the posterior approach if, if uh, anatomically suitable. A medial approach, uh, there's some caveats, sort of which I'll mention at the end. One is that since you're dealing with the popliteal artery, which is the mid-portion of the leg, and the saphenous vein is a resource that is extremely uh, important, it would seem easy to make an incision in the middle leg and use the middle portion of the vein. What we tend to tell people is that you want to save as much of the saphenous for your ensuing secondary procedures. So we either use the distal portion of the saphenous or the proximal portion of the saphenous in order not to burn that, uh, that, that bridge. Um, and so, that's, uh, it, so it may mean that you're making a bigger incision, but I, I think it saves the vein because uh, our group having, to, been, having done over 17,000 distal bypasses now, uh, I think the vast saphenous vein is a dying resource because of cardiac surgery and because of vein ablations. We're trying to pr preserve as much as possible. Uh, graft patency is, is excellent for bypass because uh, uh, many of these patients have reasonable runoff. Uh, with a good saphenous vein, you, can, you, can, you should expect uh, patency in the 80 to 90 percent. Uh, and you should expect limb salvage depending on what the patient's presented with and how, how vigorously, as uh, the nice talk that we had just had, uh, you do... Um, uh, fasciotomies uh, in the early post-op period for those patients presenting with acute ischemia. Um, now, one of the other things that we found uh, through our mistakes many times is that how do you deal with that popliteal aneurysm? Some popliteal aneurysms present with DVTs or with compression uh, in the posterior fossa. Uh, so, uh, th and those patients are ones that may not be may not benefit from endovascular repair because you have to decompress that uh, spa space occupying lesion. Um, you have to either ligate them proximally and distally or open and do an endoaneurysmorophy on those patients uh, specifically. So what we teach people for the most part is if you're going to do a bypass, you ligate uh, below the geniculates and um, uh, above the popliteal, uh, above the, obviously the distal, uh, the tibial vessels after you do their bypass. So you do an interval uh, ligation of that popliteal aneurysm. Uh, evacuating it medially is not easy and a lot of times you'll get uh, significant back bleeding from the collaterals. Uh, so it can be a little bit festive and you have to take down the ligaments. Uh, posteriorly, it's very easy to actually evacuate it and do an endoaneurysm morphy uh, and, and everything lays very nicely. Uh, this is an ugly picture from a medial approach. It looks a little bit like something out of Braveheart, but um, this is what you can see when you have a large uh, distal pop or pop popliteal aneurysm. In this picture, you can see they've taken down all the ligaments, and this can be a fairly destructive procedure. So we usually try to work above and below the knee uh, and work a little bit uh, in the fossa uh, from that, and they, uh, do a remote bypass and then evacuate the, uh, the uh, contents of the aneurysm or, uh, or just ligate it and, and uh, follow it with an ultrasound in order to, and see if there's any quote-unquote type 2 endoleaks which uh, expand it and have to sometimes go back, but not very commonly. Again, for the posterior approach, it's a uh, shorter focal aneurysms uh, or, or, or if there are larger aneurysms, you want to decompress the popliteal fossa. Um, again, that's a beautiful, a beautiful technique. You usually make a lazy S type incision so, there's, so you do not have scar formation and have trouble when they bend. Uh, they heal fairly well. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a really uh, elegant uh, technical operation because you get to see the sural nerve and you get to see uh, the lesser saphenous and you can repair it with a relatively short interposition segment. Um, if it's a small area, you can use prosthetic, although you'd much rather use um, a vein if you can do that. Sometimes that's dependent on the uh, lesser saphenous vein, how big it is. Um, don't forget these, uh, you can dilate these veins, but be very careful if you dilate them because you can cause damage uh, by using too much pressure. Uh, and this is just a picture of a, a greater, of a lesser saphenous vein uh, being used as an interposition graft for a popliteal aneurysm. Um, lastly, we'll talk a little bit. Vein grafts have, have great patency. If you're going to do a longer bypass, try not to, and you're going to go below the knee, I would not recommend using prosthetic unless you really have to. Uh, posterior approach, I think, would be the primary uh, repair if you could do it, but anatomically, it's really only about 10% of the time you really feel comfortable doing that. Uh, when, when, when you have a smaller vein, in the lesser saph or the small saphenous, sometimes you'll have to harvest the greater saphenous in either an unusual position posteriorly because the posterior approach has to be done prone, or you can harvest it first, close the wound, and then flip them over, which I try, we try not to do. Uh, looking at the outcomes, uh, uh, the outcomes between medial and posterior approach are really uh, similar. And again, you have to take this data with a little bit of grain of salt because these are uh, selected patients because, you, because of their anatomy, so it's not a prospective randomized trial. Uh, but they both they do both lead, uh, both do fairly well. 
Uh, and the late, uh, the late results are excellent. These patients should have, if they come in with a, a viable limb, they should leave with a viable limb, and they should have a, a, a relatively long uh, patency and a long-term uh, limb salvage for these. Uh, with, you know, you can see a three-year amputation rate is less than 3%. Um, for the first time, um, the uh, endovascular repair of uh, popliteal aneurysms, uh, Mike Marin and Frank Veith reported in 94. Uh, Viabon is probably the most commonly used uh, right now. Um, Again, it's about two, so you, the um, indications for that are for two centimeter aneurysms with about two centimeter um, landing zones proximally and distally, and usually like to see at least two vessel runoff, and that's partially due to embolization when you, when you manipulate the vessels. Uh, if you have a large one, you really don't want to do it, uh, and if they have a torturous, although we can straighten the uh, arteries out fairly easily now, and so the torturous component of it is only because those tend to have um, fractures and stent fractures in a long period, because if you look at the SFA, it's not a straight, or the SFA popliteal segment, it's not a straight tube. There's a lot of torque and turning in that, uh, especially when you bend and when you walk, uh, so they can cause uh, some issues. Um, uh, Cheney, when he had his bilateral popliteal aneurysm uh, repaired, he's had, I think, four to six uh, revisions of each one of them with lysis and uh, thrombectomy, and, and percutaneous thrombectomy, so uh, it, there are some concerns. Again, you use about 10 to 15 percent oversizing, like you would expect, and you want proximal distal landing zones to be fairly extensive, which again is why it limits the uh, number of patients that we can use these on. Uh, when you look at the results of endovascular versus open in this, endovascular looks better, but that's because, again, you have a very selective patient population that you have picked out, and the more complicated and the more devastated patient who presents usually gets uh, open repair or open repair after lysis, and so that's where you have the unpleasant truths and the confronting lies. Uh, so endovascular looks pretty good in this, in this technique. But again, it's, it's, you really have to recognize these early, try to get these patients before they become symptomatic uh, in order to make, get the best results. Um, and since uh, it looks simple, you would wonder why you always don't use endo. And again, I reiterate that it's because the anatomy is always uh, uh, somewhat variable as opposed to uh, infrarenal aneurysms. Um, and again, if you look at the data even more rigorously, uh, reintervention rate is about 26%, which is fairly significant. So you need to follow these patients closely because they can present with secondary acute ischemia or secondary problems uh, that can cause uh, a limb loss. Um, and again, there are some stent fractures, but these have improved over time. So hopefully we're getting to the end of this. Catheter-directed uh, um, lysis in these patients. You want these patients to have a viable foot that they can move and they can feel uh, they, um, in order to do this because the, they usually will look worse before they get better. Uh, and if they start getting worse during the, 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 during the therapy, sometimes it's very difficult to stop and it makes the uh, operations much more bloody and much more complicated. Um, but in, in many cases, in a lot of literature, it has improved uh, limb salvage over the long term because it does open up some of the distal, distal vasculature so you can do some uh, arterial reconstructions. Uh, mostly using a saphenous vein. Um, so what is the best approach? And it's really dependent on the patient's uh, anatomy and what you're most comfortable with, uh, with doing. If you have a discrete aneurysm in the posterior fossa, posterior approach is good. If you have a, a, an aneurysm that you can have a proximal and distal landing zones, uh, endovascular is probably the next best thing. If they're an acute ischemic problem or they have an extensive aneurysm uh, that goes into, uh, or they only have a single vessel runoff, you're probably gonna end up doing a bypass. Uh, and we need to follow these, uh, much like everything else, you need to follow these patients closely, whether you do an endovascular open procedure, because secondary intervention is not uncommon. And patients who have uh, peripheral aneurysm disease, uh, although it's not terribly common, at least in our experience, as I mentioned, thousands of peripheral bypasses, we've had about 25 patients who've ended up with aneurysmal disease of their saphenous vein graft, uh, probably because of an inherent uh, uh, collagen problem in those patients. Other concerns, again, I mentioned uh, don't waste the vein in the middle. Try to take the proximal distal vein. You can either use it orthograde or retrograde. Um, it's, it's always a challenging decision whether to operate early or whether to do lysis. A fasciotomy you should lib use liberally in these patients because that, after you do a good reconstruction, you can end up losing a leg just because of an incomplete fasciotomy. Uh, and again, remember to do proximal distal ligation or an endovenous morphy. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm sure you're happier to go uh, to uh, the bar. So thank you very much.